Hello and welcome to CNBC TV 18. I'm Parikshit Lutra and here are the key global headlines we are tracking this evening. Twitter temporarily closes its offices to staff after a new wave of resignations hit the company. This comes after Elon Musk issued an ultimatum asking staff to commit to a hardcore work environment. Elon Musk keeps tweeting through all the drama, even posting memes mocking the expected demise of the platform. U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi steps down from her leadership role after 15 years of leading the Democratic Party. Republican Representative Kevin McCarthy will lead the House as the next Speaker starting January. Once a close ally of Donald Trump, the New York Post trolls the former U.S. President days after he announced his presidential candidature. The outlet headlined the story, Been There, Done That. Last week, uh, the Post's cover called the former president Trumpy Dumpty, who had a great fall. Rishi Sunak's new British government unveils a long-awaited fiscal policy, imposes a windfall tax on energy producers, lowers the threshold for the highest income tax bracket to bring more people under its ambit, removes tax offs for electric vehicles, also announcing sweeping spending cuts. Nine months into the war with Ukraine, Russian forces have been forced to abandon the only provincial capital they had managed to capture since the invasion began on November 9. Russia announced a withdrawal from Kherson, marking a potential turning point in the war. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky celebrated victory and distributed medals to the soldiers and Ukrainian troops. With Ukraine strengthening its military capacity through support from the West, upgrading from land-based to air-based to heavy battle tanks, Russia is now facing a challenge to hold its occupied territories in Ukraine. What does the loss in Kherson mean for Russia? Let's go across to Anna Chernikova, reporter at The Voice of America, to discuss more. Anna, first of all, as uh, Russia has withdrawn from Kherson, we're also getting reports of torture chambers. Could you elaborate for us as to what has been disco discovered there by Ukrainian forces? Uh, good uh, good day. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, well, for the moment, what we hear is that basically the uh, situation in Kherson and Kherson region is very similar to what uh, Ukrainian forces and Ukrainian authorities and international society have already seen in the liberated areas of Kyiv region and Kharkiv region uh, after those areas uh, have been cleared by Ukrainian forces. Uh, and basically, the situation is similar in terms of uh, the the findings uh, of uh, of the chamber of tortures uh, we, could, we can put it this way uh, also uh, reportedly there are mass graves that should be investigated uh, and also we already know that uh, there are bodies of uh, military um, and also of the civilians that have been found uh, and uh, of course investigation is ongoing so basically uh, the picture uh, the general picture is very similar uh, to what but uh, the whole world and Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian authorities have already seen in the recently liberated areas uh, months, ago, months ago. And um, for the moment, investigation right. is ongoing. We don't have particular details or particular numbers so far. Uh, but of course, we're waiting for the, right. for the official numbers uh, and uh, we are waiting for uh, the updates from there. For the moment, the city of Kherson itself and Kherson region right. uh, is suffering of the lack of electricity, you know, and all this stuff, but uh, and all the supplies. But uh, the city is coming back to life. Okay, Anna, uh, we're also learning about Russian airstrikes on gas and electric uh, electricity infrastructure in Ukraine. Tell us how Russia has uh, intensified or changed strategy after the withdrawal from Kherson. Uh, well, um, I, I cannot say that they've changed, but they definitely continue their attacks. And the main target of these attacks is, as you correctly said, uh, critical infrastructure, including energy infra infrastructure and gas infrastructure. Uh, so uh, if we if we look at the yesterday attacks, those attacks uh, were targeting mostly gas infrastructure. But if we look back at the, uh, at the November 15th attack, uh, the, the, the most massive attack, 
uh, that was happening um, in terms of the amount of missiles that Russian forces used on Ukraine. Uh, this attack was definitely the continuation of the of those previous uh, of the last months targeting energy electricity infrastructure. For the moment, situation with 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 uh, with energy uh, in general uh, is quite critical, especially electricity. Uh, so Ukraine, uh, all regions of Ukraine suffer of shortages and outages. So for the moment, uh, Ukraine has this planned scheduled outages for electricity and uh, people have uh, basically have a couple of hours without electricity and a couple of hours with electricity and so on and so forth. For the moment, I have outage myself. So um, we have basically to, the whole country is basically uh, planning uh, the life according to those. Uh, in terms of gas, situation is better for the moment. Of course, if we, we're not taking uh, into, if, if we're not taking into consideration occupied and recently liberated areas, because recently liberated areas have a very big right. problem with both uh, and also with water supply. All right, uh, Anna Chernikova, thank you very much for joining us here on Global Eye, giving us uh, uh, your view and a ground report of how things impact and the dark background behind you also reflecting what many Ukrainians are going through, power cuts uh, and outages because of Russian airstrikes as well. Thank you very much, Anna Chernikova, for joining us. Now, to discuss the impact of sanctions on Russia, according to the Atlantic Council, if Western countries impose sanctions at the scale at which they did in 2022, we would reach more than 36,500 sanctions in the first quarter of 2023. These would be primarily impacting Russia. The report also says that sanctions have resulted in 70% reduction in semiconductor exports to Russia. So how will sanctions impact the global economy? Will price caps on Russian oil work? And how will export controls impact China? Joining me to discuss this Atlantic Council report are Charles Lichfield, Deputy Director at uh, Geoeconomic Center Atlantic Council. Also with me, Maya Nikoladze, Program Assistant at the Atlantic Council as well. Charles, if I can begin with you, uh, are the sanctions really working on uh, the Russian economy, hurting the Russian government. Give us a sense of the sectors which have been impacted, according to your report. Thanks for inviting us, Parikshit. Uh, yes, the sanctions are <clears throat> impacting many sectors. Uh, the oft-quoted stat is the automobile sector, uh, where production has fallen um, almost 70 percent. Um, and this is simply because of their difficulty in buying technology from outside Russia. Uh, so the export controls are working very well. I think at the beginning of this crisis, at the, at the beginning of the war, uh, there was a sense that the financial sanctions might work faster and might even get uh, President Putin to change his policy and pull his troops out of Ukraine. This was always an extremely naive view. Uh, and therefore, the sanctions have been mm. expected to achieve great things very quickly, which they can't. But that doesn't mean that they're not working. Right. Uh, Maya, if I can ask you about how they will intensify. Of course, the, the intensity of sanctions will depend on how this war continues. But what is your sense on the kind of measures that we could see by Western nations? Um, the types of measures we could see uh, by Western uh, nations against Russia are mostly financial sanctions and export controls. We have already um, seen export controls uh, being imposed by the United States. Now other countries are joining and intensifying as well. For example, the United Kingdom um, recently imposed export controls, uh, which are sometimes called tech sanctions um, against Russia's key industries such as IT, engineering, and they intend to um, slow down um, these Russian key industries. So we are likely to see um, the escalation of export controls. Um, and uh, to explain what export controls are, they are um, measures designed by the Commerce Department to restrict um, the flow of technologies to Russia and in other contexts against other countries as well. Uh, but we will see more export controls in terms of uh, financial sanctions. As long as the war continues, we are likely to witness more sanctions against Russia. But Russia will also try to evade um, mm. sanctions and countries that are suspecting indirectly helping Russia's evasion exports will also likely to get sanctioned even more. Mm. 
Right. Uh, Charles, coming back to you, we, we also see uh, the Western nations, US, European Union proposing uh, a price cap on Russian oil. This has been discussed with India. So th there is lack of clarity whether there will be eventual consensus or not, how many countries will accept it. Uh, but how do you think this will uh, impact the Russian economy? Will it bring down the price of Russian oil? How will Russia react? I can say one or two things about uh, what consensus is needed. Maya can take you through the detail of how the cap is meant to work. Um, it does not need uh, the entire world except for Russia um, to be agreeing with the price cap for it to work in, at least in theory. Uh, the leverage that uh, G7 countries and a few more is, are using uh, are um, insurance markets and shipping markets where they still have quite a lot of control and uh, as of uh, December 5th, when the EU ban on seaborne Russian uh, oil imports kicks in, uh, they will allow other countries to use their shipping and insurance services as long as uh, oil has been paid for at a certain price uh, or below. Um, it was the case that they were considering a sort of floating cap, uh, but that is no longer the case. Uh, I think Maya can tell you a little bit um, about uh, the mechanism uh, and its history. Right. I'd just like to uh, follow up from there, uh, Maya. Uh, if you'd like to add on the oil price cap issue, how it's going to work. Also, specifically to you, do the sanctions actually threaten the dollar and uh, U.S. payment systems? Uh, yes, so first on your oil price caps um, issue, uh, oil, so Russian um, cargoes that sell oil above the specified capped price will be denied Western um, insurance and maritime services, but that also extends to the buyer companies of Russian oils. If they are purchasing Russian oil at a capped price, they can also keep Western um, insurance. But if they decide to pay more um, for Russian oil, then they will also lose access to um, Russian insurance. So foreign oil companies um, so buying from Russia will have a choice, either pay the specified capped price and keep Western insurance, or pay above um, and be denied um, insurance. Uh, so. These are not designed to um, oil price caps will not harm are not designed to harm foreign oil companies, but rather they are designed to keep oil flowing out of Russia, but reducing um, oil revenues to Russia. Now, in terms of your second question about the dollar dominance, um, economic statecraft um, experts and um, uh, experts have been observing um, the trends that dollar reserves worldwide have decreased in this year. Um, however. We would caution against a rush interpretation because what happened in 2022 was that um, the dollar appreciated uh, by 6% against emerging uh, market economies and that made it um, and um, their natural like, default move um, to was to um, avoid weakening of their local currencies, which is why they have been unable to um, sort of obtain uh, more US dollar. Um, there are these trends, we will be monitoring mm -hmm. them in 2023. But um, there is no reason to call for a dethroning of um, dollar or um, weakening of dollar as of yet. Okay, uh, we're running out of time. Charles, my final question would be on China. Uh, the U.S. export controls on China, especially on semiconductors, how much are they likely to impact the U.S. economy and the Chinese economy? Again, you'll be in better hands with bias answer to your question. Right, Maya, if you'd like to take that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so in terms of the effects of, um, so first um, to talk about why recent control, uh, export controls are so important. Um, uh, recently, the US invoked the foreign direct product rule and how is it different from um, regular export controls the U.S. Um, imposes is that it goes um, beyond the United States. It extends to foreign companies that use U.S. origin software or hardware in their production process. And such companies um, exporting semiconductors to China will have to obtain a license before um, selling um, them to China. So it's extraterritorial, and that's why it's so significant. It's not targeting only specific entities um, in China. Now, in terms of the effects of uh, on the U.S. economy, 
semiconductors, all types of semiconductors um, are 9%, around 9% of total US exports to China. But this um, foreign product um, uh, direct rule is covering only highly advanced um, semiconductors. And those semiconductors are much small, uh, smaller fr fraction of um, US total US chip exports. Um, so the industry that is likely to get hit most is semiconductor manufacturing equipment or uh, SME um, producing um, industry. Uh, but uh, overall chip exports won't be affected as much and that's also um, the case for Taiwan around 60% um, right. of their chip exports go to um, China but all, they said that only smaller fraction of that okay. will be affected by export controls all right uh, Maya we've run out of time but thank you so much to you and Charles for joining us summing up the impact of sanctions on Russia and the global economy we're going to take a break, but up next, United States former presidential candidate Joe Walsh joins us to discuss the results of the U.S. midterm election and Donald Trump's 2024 presidential announcement. Welcome back. You are watching Global Eye. The Republicans have taken control of the House of Representatives, ending two years of the Democrats controlling both houses of the Congress. Republicans have secured 218 seats needed for a majority, but the winning margin is razor thin. Democrats have performed better than expected, but when the Congress convenes in January, Republicans have enough numbers to stall President Biden's legislative agenda. Donald Trump has formally entered the 2024 presidential race, announcing his candidature. The 76-year-old former president hit out at Joe Biden, saying the last two years have been a time of pain, hardship, anxiety and despair for Americans. So how will this midterm election impact U.S. politics and what are the cues for the 2024 election? We are joined by Joe Walsh, former Republican presidential candidate in 2020 and also a talk show host and political columnist. Thank you very much, Mr. Walsh, for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Let me begin by asking you, Republicans have managed to take control of the House of Representatives, but they have underperformed. What could be some of the factors, some of the reasons for their underperformance? A, a big factor for that was Trump. Uh, Trump made himself a big story in these midterms. Trump is still popular in the Republican Party, but most Americans can't stand him. The other big factor was the abortion issue. It brought a lot of people out to vote. Democrats defied history in a midterm. That's a really big deal. Uh, also to ask you, how does this really complicate things for the Republicans? The fact that Donald Trump has gone ahead, announced his candidature, we believe that the party is severely divided over this issue. Look, I, it's, uh, it, it's, I know it's hard for the rest of the world to understand because Donald Trump is so unfit, but he's the leader still of the Republican Party. He announced this past week, kind of a weird time to announce that he's running for re-election, but most Republican voters are still with him. Mm. He's the king of the Republican Hill until another Republican can knock him off of that hill. Mm. Kevin McCarthy and the Republicans in Congress, they know that. Mm. So they still have to bow to Trump. Right. So you believe that he could still be the official candidate and may even pull off the 2024 election? Oh, I, look, I, I uh, right now, Donald Trump is the clear favorite to be the Republican Party nominee in 2024. Most of the Republican Party is still with him. Could he become president again? Sure, he could. Mm. That's a scary thing to say, and it should scare the world. It certainly scares most Americans. But yes, he has a chance to become president again if he's the nominee. Right. Uh, if I were to ask you, and probably because of these problems, Republicans have not performed as well in this election, what are some of the key factors that are going to play out? If we were to ask you for some of the cues for 2024 from this midterm election, what would they be for Democrats and the Republicans? Unfortunately, because the Republicans won the House, uh, nothing will get done these next two years. 
Republicans have made very clear that they're not interested in policy. Uh, all they want to do is th they want revenge. They want revenge for how they believe the Democrats treated Trump. So the Republicans in the House are going to investigate Hunter Biden. They're going to investigate Joe Biden. They're going to investigate, 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 and probably try to impeach some Democrats. They're going to be focused on this. Kevin McCarthy will be the speaker, but people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, some of the crazier Republicans, are really going to be running the show. Right. Uh, so you're clear that at this point, the strongest candidate from the Republican camp is Donald Trump. If I were to ask you about the Democrats right now, President Biden has said that he has an intention to run again for 2024 presidential election. Is he the strongest candidate right now in the Democrat camp? Or you feel that there are other contenders we need to watch out for very closely? You know, it's a pretty sad thing that this great country might be looking at a Biden-Trump rematch. That's pretty pathetic when you think about it. Uh, B Biden, I'll, I'm not sure Biden's going to run. Biden's a strong candidate against Trump. And Biden believes only he can beat Trump. If not Biden, uh, boy, I'll tell you what, the Democrats are going to have a hard time finding a candidate who could beat Trump. I think they'd look toward a governor, like maybe the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, or the governor of California, uh, Newsom. Uh, it's going to have to be a new face, um, but that's going to be really difficult to do. Hmm. What about Kamala Harris? I, I, I didn't mean to overlook Kamala Harris. Yes, if Biden doesn't run, Kamala Harris would certainly be in the discussion. Um, she's popular among Democrats. I don't think she's very popular among most of the country right now. She'd have to show Americans that she's capable of being president, and she hasn't done that so far. And, and finally, 2020 was an ugly election. What kind of a political period are we entering now? If you thought 2020 was an ugly election, this next election in America, 24, is going to be the ugliest we've seen in a long, long time. America is going through a real ugly period. Uh, we're very divided. Uh, a lot of people don't know if America will stay together. I don't know if America will stay together. So the, the world just needs to know that this next election is going to be worse. But I think we're in for a long period of this. Thank you once again, uh, Mr. Walsh, for joining us here on CNBC TV 18 Global Eye, giving us your view on the midterm elections and its impact on American politics. Thank you. All right, with that, it's a wrap on this edition of Global Eye. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.